going. We've got Jenny, who's going to talk to us about submarine gully morphology. Thank you. I'm going to come up at this um, from a slightly different angle and talk to you about new insights into processes influencing submarine gullies. So submarine gullies are one of the most common morphological features that we find in the submarine environment on continental margins, slopes and canyons. But like Martian environments, the processes which actually form these gullies aren't well documented or well understood. It's important for us to try and understand the processes operating in these areas to try and help us to predict and mitigate submarine geohazards, such as turbidity currents, which can break submarine cables, for example. They're also important for helping us to reconstruct past glacial history and for understanding how the continental margins have evolved. So we find a huge range of different um, gullies in a huge range of different environments across all latitudes and at a huge range of different water depths. For example, we find them on the flanks of our sediment drifts in water depths of about 3,000 metres. We find them on the flanks of volcanic islands and craters, at mid-ocean ridges. We all find, also find them on continental margins at a whole range of different latitudes, in deep sea submarine canyons, and also in very, very shallow water environments, so in fjords and deltaic environments. In the marine environment, we classify a submarine gully as having a distinct topographic uh, channel. We don't necessarily need them to have a, a, an alcove or a fan like we were talking about yesterday. But in most cases, we, we, we suggest that we, we use the definition that they're more than, they have more than a five metre relief. And they're suggested to be formed by a number of different mechanisms. For example, mass flows, including turbidity currents, debris flows, slides and slumping. And these can be triggered by a number of different uh, factors. For example, contour currents or tidal pumping beneath ice sheets. Also, iceberg scouring on the, on the shelf edge, uh, earthquakes, subglacial meltwater that's released from beneath an ice sheet, and also gas hydrate dissociation. They can also be influenced by oceanographic processes such as dense water overflows or riverine processes, also tectonic or lithological processes. So the way we look at seafloor morphology is by using mainly multi-beam bathymetric data that's collected on ships. And we can use repeat uh, surveys to look at how the seafloor has been changing recently, and also seismic and sub-bottom data to look at uh, cross-sectional um, change in gullies and also how they've developed. So I've been looking at this geophysical data by uh, measuring a number of gully parameters to try and identify if we can use this to see how uh, processes are influencing seafloor morphology. So I've been uh, measuring gully length, width, uh, relief, the density of, of gullies, uh, how far they cut back into the continental slope, the head shape, uh, the sinuosity of the channels, uh, the, how, how they're branching, uh, the cross-sectional shape, for example, and also environmental parameters such as the slope gradient, the slope geometry, and the environmental setting that they're found in. And I've been using statistical and quantitative analysis to identify quantitatively di distinct gullies from these different environments. And this is just an example of some of the different cross plots that you can see of some of the different gully parameters. More recently, we've also been using marine robotics to help us get better resolution data. So instead of looking at a 30 metre resolution bathymetric data that we can get from the ship, we're now able to get 25 centimetre resolution data using these autonomous underwater vehicles and also using these remotely operated vehicles. We can get high resolution bathymetry, we can get high resolution video footage from in, inside the gully systems and we can also get targeted sediment cores and grab samples using the, the coring system and the, the grabs that we have. And another direction that uh, marine research is going is in situ process monitoring. So we've been involved in some experiments where we're putting sensors directly in some of these deep water environments to try and measure um, processes as they happen in situ. So we've been using these ac acoustic Doppler current profilers that sit a couple of metres off the seafloor and they can measure current flow direction and velocity as a turbidity current or sediment density flow actually goes past the sensor. And we can also use sediment trap data to give us an idea of sediment concentration. So I'm going to show you some data today from um, focusing on continental margins. So I'll show you data from the Arctic, from parts of the Antarctic, and also through some um, canyon systems. And this includes some data that we collected uh, a couple of months ago from the Whitard Canyon 
on the Celtic margin. So these are um, some of the gully types that we see on the Antarctic and the Arctic continental margin. And through this quantitative analysis, we identified five distinct gully types. And you can see that they, they look quite different. The, the red colour here is the shallower water depth. The blue is the, uh, the deeper water. So unfortunately, they're going uphill. But, um, and these are cross-sectional um, profiles across each of the, the shelf edges. And you can see that um, in the top left, we have branching and sinuous features. In the middle there, we have more shallow and rounded features. We have very linear um, and shelf incising features. We also have gullies with quite an indistinct axis. And we have V-shaped and quite a low length features. We also find distinct gully types on canyon environments. And this is from our um, recent data that we collected a few months ago. You've got these undulating gully systems. You've also got um, below this hanging gullies where we have gullies in size in the top of the canyon. And these terminate in an abrupt uh, vertical wall. And then we have small debris fans at the base of the gully axis. We also have small scale shoots. We have these very um, shelf incising and dendritic features. And we have this new feature that we haven't seen elsewhere, these arete-like features, where you have very um, indented and, in, and an incised network, but the interflues are very sharp, they're almost vertical. And here, this is the canyon system as a whole, the main branches have just been marked in white. So from the quantitative and statistical analysis, we've identified these distinctly different uh, gully types. And it's likely that the, the morphology is influenced by a number of different factors, a number of different processes, um, or a number of different considerations. And I'll just briefly take you through of these, con these considerations. Now, the first is that it's the underlying geology or the sediment yield that's having an influence on the different morphologies that we see along the continental margins. But from the data we've looked at in the Antarctic and the Arctic, for, for example, sediment core data, uh, seismic data, we know that the, the underlying geology is glaciogenic or glacially influenced sediments. And these have quite a limited range of characteristics in terms of similar lithology, similar grain size, similar physical properties. So it's unlikely, especially in the polar regions, that the underlying geology is having a significant influence on the different morphologies that we see. However, the new data that we've recently collected, these are RET-like systems. We're looking now at 25 centimetre resolution data. You can see um, from these high resolution video footage that the interflues in between them are very sharp. They're almost vertical. And these look very similar to features that you can um, see in the terrestrial environment, these karstic-like features that are formed through processes such as dissolution of carbonate platforms, for example. And this is just something that we're starting to look at. We've only had the data um, a couple of months, so it's a work in progress at the moment. But it could be in some cases that the underlying geology is having an influence on the different morphologies. The second consideration is that it's actually a variation in the dominant slate process that's having um, a significant influence on the morphology. And as I mentioned earlier, research um, in the marine environment is going towards this in situ flow monitoring. And this is an example of some of the data that Talling et al. collected um, last year in Squamish Fjord in Canada. And it shows a turbidity current as it's passing um, past one of these underwater sensors. So uh, this is looking at flow velocity. The red is the higher velocity. The blue is the lower velocity. And this is time and hours. So it's a relatively, relatively small flow. But these turbidity currents leave behind, again, specific signatures in the sedimentary record. They leave behind turbidites. And again, on the cruise a few months ago to the Wittard Canyon, we took a number of sediment cores along different flanks of the gullies. So these are two of the cores, core 98 and 124, which are on the axis of this um, gully system here. And we actually found quite distinct turbidite deposits through the, through the core sections. And this indicates that the uh, gully morphology, well, the most recent gully morphology, has been influenced by these turbidity currents uh, relatively recently. We also find evidence for debris flow activity. We find these debris fans at the base of some of these hanging gully systems. Um, this isn't the actual one. This is just an example that you can see in the terrestrial environment. But this indicates that we do have this debris flow activity coming down the main axis of these gullies. And this is also quite interesting because it indicates that the processes operating on the canyon flanks are actually more active or have been active more recently than the major processes that we know are coming down the main canyon axis. Otherwise, these uh, fans would have been eroded. 
These are a few more high resolution images from um, within the gully systems that we took from our remotely operated vehicle. Here you can see scouring within the main axis of one of the gullies. We also found huge lumps of debris within the gully systems, indicating that they have been influenced by debris flow activity. Again, we found more debris and slumping um, of the gully flanks. And at the heads of the gullies, we, kind of, we saw peeling off of, of the heads. And this indicates or suggests that actually the gu gullies are, are eroding back into the shelf uh, retrogressively. And this can give us an idea of um, how they are evolving. Other considerations are the environmental um, controls or the environmental setting. So, for example, the slope gradient and the slope geometry. But actually, especially on the Antarctic margin, the slope gradients are, are relatively similar through, throughout the areas we've looked at. And they're unlikely to be, be causing the large-scale changes in morphology. Although in a local area, we do think that they have an influence, especially on the sinuosity and the length of some of, some of the systems. And it's likely that the glacial history, especially in the polar areas, are also having an influence. Um, we're talking about the size of the ice sheets involved, when they were last at the shelf edge, whether they reached the shelf edge at all, how much sediment they were pushing, and the amount of meltwater associated with the ice sheets are likely to have had an influence. And a final consideration are, is whether the gullies are actually in different stages of development or evolution. Um, we know um, from looking at sub-bottom profile data that the geophysical signature that we're seeing from the gullies is a relatively good representation of, of what the gullies actually look like. We don't see a lot of sediment infilling. And we can also see that the gullies are most likely to be incisional features rather than being built up um, from the gully interflutes. So just to summarise, we find that seafloor morphology can provide quite a, um, a good insight into processes operating in the marine environment and those um, influencing gully morphology. And from our quantitative analysis of the different gully parameters, we find distinct gully types from continental margin environments. And we find that gully, gully morphology can be influenced by a wide range of different processes and that different environmental settings, for example, can have an influence on the processes, such, such as gradient and geometry of the slope, for example. We also find evidence that um, the processes are quite likely to be active. For example, we find the turbidite deposits, we find debris fans, and we find, see active slumping of the um, gully margins. And I'll leave you with this last slide. These are um, some more of the data that we collected from the recent cruise a couple of months ago. And these are just some pictures that I took from um, through some of the talks I saw yesterday and in the literature. And I was just struck by how similar some of these features actually look on first glance. You can see these are RET-like systems. From what I understand, they're quite a similar scale to those that you see on Martian landscapes. Um, even the shapes of the gully heads look quite similar, the abrupt termination, and also the, the depositional fans at the base all seem to look quite similar. And this is quite interesting, the talk we had yesterday, that we were talking about different processes actually resulting in, in quite a similar geomorphology or geomorphic signature. Thank you. It's from these in situ sensors, so we haven't actually got the data back. It's, a, an, ex an, it's an experiment that's ongoing at the moment, and we put acoustic uh, Doppler current profilers um, on moorings in the canyon, and we leave them there for a couple of months, and then hope that a turbidity current will come past, and then it can measure the current velocity and current direction um, from this data when we retrieve the mooring. Do you see any evidence of abandonment of gullies? Looking at seismic data, you actually see that they progress with the margin. Yeah. So, so you can see that, that something keeps them kind of in the same place. They keep on evolving. It's not, you know, the, the, they're evolving with the margin. So, but do you mean to say that the margin is advancing outward and the gully stays in place? In some cases, but obviously they must be filling in or they'd turn into canyons. But, um, but, but I mean, they don't, you can see them kind of going back in time in, with the seismic data. So, in, in areas that I've looked at, um, I'm not sure about in all margins, but some of the, in some of the areas, like the um, some of the kind of indistinct axes, 
we think are um, like this type here. These look like they're, they're, they might be older features or ancient or relic features. Um, the edges look less sharp, for example. So um, we haven't got seismic data over that bit, unfortunately. <laughs> You started off by um, saying that the literature had postulated four or five different yep. processes by which these uh, gullies might be formed, and then you had four or five different subtypes of gullies that yep. you've identified in your data sets. I'm sure you can't just draw yeah. lines between them, but how close do you think you could be to putting processes to some of your subcategories? Well, one of the main processes in the literature was that um, some of these large, deeply incised gullies were formed by um, cascading dense water overflows. But one of the areas we looked at is the um, Weddell Sea margin, where we've got um, mooring data showing that we've got these active um, cascading flows going over the sea. Um, but the data that we've got back from the shelf edge are these very, very small scale um, U-shaped features. Um, we didn't find any evidence of these deeply incised features that we see elsewhere. So we've ruled that out as one of the major gully forming mechanisms. Um, so that was kind of that's quite a big advancement. But you can, yeah. I mean, some of the others like these, um, the smaller scale features, we think are more likely to be debris flow or kind of slide deposits. Whereas the larger features, the deeply incised ones, are uh, turbidity currents generated by um, meltwater and other um, yeah. such processes. I think, I think that would be the way to go, mm. to um, rule out. Yeah, that's what we started to try and do. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Alfred of the Kewen, to talk on small Martian gullies associated with the recurring slope linear. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, the small gullies associated with RSL, but also say some things about equatorial gullies in, in general since they're kind of neglected. And uh, some, an example of them is shown uh, uh, in this uh, cover slide here. This is almost right on the equator, fairly well-defined uh, gullies. I'll come back to this site. So uh, I looked up a definition of gully in the AGI dictionary. It's a little different than what we discussed yesterday where it's, you know, too, too big to remove with ordinary tillage, but it's never still an agricultural definition. Um, and it assumes concentrated flow of water, intermittent flow of water. Um, so in any event, the, the RSL-related channels fit this definition in terms of size. They're often, uh, you know, one to 20 meters wide and, and half greater than about half a meter deep, which is about what you can't obliterate with tillage. Uh, I used to... Actually, 40 years ago, I worked in the Peace Corps in Guatemala on preventing gully erosion. So uh, I've always had a funny attitude towards gullies being good things on Mars. They were bad things in, in, uh, in agriculture. Okay, so the, uh, the classic Martian gullies in the middle latitudes are much larger and, and likely form from CO2 frost, uh, uh, fluidized uh, debris flows. Uh, it, but to minimize confusion, I'm going to call the RSL-related gullies small gullies, even though they're really more typical gully-sized gullies. Uh, the largest ones are in Ballas Marineris, equatorial. Now, Tanya did her global CTX-based image survey and reported no equatorial gullies, uh, but I'll show you that these are just barely discernible at, at the scale of, of CTX. So a couple of key questions. Does RSL activity carve small gullies? And does RSL activity include flowing water such that these would actually meet the definition of AGI, terrestrial definition of gullies? So here's this site in uh, Libya Montes again. And uh, so these are fairly well-defined with an alcove channel fan. Uh, I think the slopes here are pretty steep. Uh, maybe steeper than typical mid-latitude gullies, but we haven't uh, checked on that yet. Here's what it looks like in CTX. You can kind of make it out there, but you'd have to be brave to, to map it based on that. Now, there are uh, gullies on the moon that are interpreted as dry granular flows. Here are some pictures here from, from Rock. And uh, these are pretty similar to the equatorial gully in, in New Libya Montes that I just showed you. Uh, and uh, I think these are also uh, on very steep slopes. 
There are also gully-like forms on, on the moon that are related to drain back of impact melt. Uh, and those can look like debris flows, actually. All right, so some equatorial gullies also produce levee deposits, as shown here. This is, again, right on the equator. And now, the gullies associated with RSL are a little different. Uh, they tend to have you know, no alcove, or maybe you could call that an alcove, but small. And they have very long and narrow channels. And so there are channels down to the limits of resolution here, so less than a meter wide. So those are actually too small to be terrestrial gullies. Um, this is on the uh, crater wall uh, uh, on the floor of Melis Chasm. And here, again, just for global context and looking at CTX, what it looks like. You can see a lineation there. You really, you know, be brave to interpret those as gullies. Uh, now, the equatorial gullies are, are poorly mapped. Uh, John talked about the, this abstract in the paper that's uh, in revision. Um, they looked at the first 25,000 orbits of MRO, which is about you know, half of the orbits we've had, uh, and found quite a few equatorial gullies of different types. Uh, but this is about, after about 25,000 orbits is when we first discovered the equatorial RSL. We started specifically targeting steep slopes in the equatorial region to look for more of them. So this map, although it covers half the orbits, covers less than half of the equatorial gullies that we've now found. Particular in Valles Marneris, none are shown. There's a vast number in here. The cover slide in Libya Montes is not on here. So uh, I, I hope somebody can complete that study one of these days. Uh, we have seen some rare topographic changes in equatorial gullies. This is in Ganges Chasm, and there's lighting variations here, so this is a little hard to see, but I'll just zoom in on, on one area here. And you can see a bright spot in three time steps uh, changing between these. And so that may be a boulder that's migrating down the channel. Uh, it could also just be boulders that are being covered and, and exposed from fine sediment motion. But this is within the sulfate-rich deposits. It's very crumbly. This, this forms gullies very easily on Earth. It's material. Okay, so let's talk about recurring slope lineae. We've heard about these already, but just to summarize, these are dark flows on steep slopes, typically associated with bedrock or rocks, a few meters wide, uh, up, uh, uh, and from meters up to one and a half kilometers long. I'll show you that example. They're not found on most steep rocky slopes, so some slopes are different. Um, they recur annually at nearly the same location in multiple Mars years. They grow gradually or incrementally over a period of several months, then they fade over a, a fairly rapid period of weeks to months. And they're often associated with small gullies, and I think these are really distinct gullies in this particular case here. Uh, these are up to about half a kilometer long, so these are, you know, these are not really small gullies. They're, they're substantial features. And this is in Juvente Chasm, again, equatorial. Here's what this looks like in CTX. Those are, those are a little more distinct. Um, here's the high-rise browse image, to, just to get an overview of this hill here. There are small gullies in RSL on all sides, here, 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 there, there, here, there, everywhere. There's all around this thing are, are small gullies in RSL. They extend almost to the top. Uh, of this hill. And there's other hills like this. So I'll come back to the site uh, later. Now, there's also some RSL that don't have resolved channels, at least, uh, such as this site. This is Corazal Crater in the mid latitudes. Um, maybe there's small channels in here that we just can't resolve uh, here. Another thing about this site is that these, these RSL appear to stop. This is greatly speeded up, by the way. These appear to stop in the middle of a 30-degree slope. Uh, so this gives the impression that the length of these things is volume limited. And that may be true here, but not other places, as I'll show you. Um, so this is in Palakir Crater. Another animated GIF that I think we've seen before here from Marion. But uh, in this case, uh, 
th these are basically gully alcoves, and the main gullies are we're way off this way. So the RSL are much smaller than the gullies. They're underfit. There are smaller channels that the, the RSL follow in here, uh, but the, but the RSL did not carve these much larger gullies unless it was much more active in the past. Probably they're just following the pre-existing topography. Okay, so we've heard about water tracks in, in Antarctica. This is a little animated GIF from satellite images from, from Joe Levy. Uh, and so there's some definite similarities here in terms of how they grow. They're dark, they go down s steep slopes. Uh, What's often bothered me about this particular GIF is how these RSL have these pointy tips to them, whereas the RSL tend to have these more blunt tips. But I've seen other water track images in which they have more blunt tips, so I don't know if that is is important uh, distinction or not. Um, Sam was asking whether any of these RSL leave bright deposits. He expects salt salt deposits to occur. And what we can say is that there, there do appear to be bright deposits left behind. Here's the newer RSL here, and, and we interpret this as older RSL deposits that are bright. Some interesting color variations. Now, we can't tell you what the composition is from high-rise colors. It's influenced mainly by, by iron mineralogy, but, but iron can be just a trace contaminant within transparent salts. Uh, so that's what we see, but the, it doesn't mean that's a, the dominant composition. Um, chrism cannot detect anhydrous chlorides. Uh, there are reasons to think these could be chloride salts. Uh, they can see the hydrated chlorides and perchlorates and uh, have seen that, in fact, in a few places, and we'll show you that. But here we can't, most, most of these places, we don't really have any mineralogic uh, constraints. The chrism coverage is very limited, and it's more limited now than in the past because of the limited gimbal motion and limited use of their cryocooler. This is uh, Ganges chasm. So here's a global map of RSL, including candidates. Some of these are poor candidates, such as Gale Crater. We don't really believe those, but I just, mapped all of these, and, and this was for a landing site workshop, so I listed the candidate landing sites that are nearby here. Uh, but um, they pretty much occur at all elevations, except the very highest Tharsis Montes, where it's, it's heavily dust mantled. Uh, stronger correlation is with albedo. This is a test albedo map. They strongly prefer the lowest albedo places on Mars. Uh, even these that appear to be in high albedo regions are in local low albedo patches. Um, it, so this is a very strong correlation, unless there are these slope streaks in the dusty areas, and maybe some of those are really RSL-like. We've been monitoring those, and so far we haven't seen the kind of temporal behavior that we use to define RSL. They appear to be episodic uh, dust avalanches, probably. Okay, and you can see concentrations in Valles Marineris, Acidalia. Uh, this is the Newton Crater region, which is also very abundant in, in gullies. There's lots of RSL here. There's more than we've got mapped here just because we compete with ourselves in targeting one site intensively. We don't sample the surrounding area as well. Let's see, the seasonality. Um, the, the RSL in the southern hemisphere are active in, in southern summer on equator-facing slopes. Um, that's what we found first. In Valles Mar Marineris, equatorial regions, they often follow the sun, and that's what this uh, GIF shows. When the sun is to the south, they're ha uh, active on the south-facing slope. When the sun is to the north, they're active on the north-facing slope. So it's this, the slope getting the most illumination is where they're active, and this, this repeats around the, the year. You can tell what the season is by looking at an image of this crater. Um, <laughs> Now, in the northern hemisphere, they, they grow the most in the very early spring, and they persist through the summer. So it's not the mirror image of the southern hemisphere, but the seasons are also not a mirror image because of, you know, southern summer is near perihelion, uh, and northern summer is longer but cooler. Uh, they're generally associated with peak temperatures, usually greater than 250 K, but there are some exceptions to that. 
Uh, this strongly suggests that activity is triggered by a volatile, uh, and it's not CO2. These temperatures are far too warm for, for CO2. Another puzzling observation is that the RSL appear more common after a period of high dust opacity. Uh, I don't think it's because it, in all areas that dust is being deposited uh, and, and therefore being removed and making them more obvious. I think that they're really more, more active. We don't really understand this. The, the high dust opacity makes for cooler daytime temperatures and warmer nighttime temperatures. And we don't have a good understanding of what's happening to uh, relative humidity in the atmosphere during dusty periods because it hides it from orbital view. Okay, topographic changes. We've seen slumps associated with RSL. This was the first one we saw. Here are the RSL up here. So it's on the, the fan below the RSL. Some RSL extend down you know, further here. Uh, this is a topographic slump. You can see the toe of this old one. The lighting here doesn't show it real well. And this, it's dark, but it faded within a, a month or two, similar to the time scales that the RSL fade. Um, we've seen more of these. Uh, this is back in Juvente Chasm, that same hill I showed you before. There's another one that formed. It was, again, dark. It's very similar to this one. Uh, and it faded again within a couple of months. Uh, so for context, that was right here. I previously showed you this region of this, this same hill. So we have, in this hill, we have active RSL, we have these small gullies, and we have these slumps. We've seen three other slumps around this hill, active you know, new slumps, as well as very recent-looking slumps. So what's, what's the relationship between these uh, different features? It could be that the RSL activity erodes the channels and deposits a fan on an already steep slope, and eventually that becomes unstable and slumps. Okay, so a uh, paper published last fall by Oja et al. on spectral evidence for hydrated uh, oxychlorine salts. It, it could be perchlorates, it could be hydrated chlorides. Uh, and you can see the spectra are really quite noisy because we're trying to measure single pixel spectra uh, because these are such small features and then the line is a smoothing function here. Uh, it does, you know, it does provide a best fit to sodium perchlorate and magnesium perchlorate, not calcium perchlorate. So as Sam was saying yesterday, you'd expect a dry area to have calcium perchlorate. If there's any water activity, you expect the magnesium and sodium perchlorate to be more active. So that's, that's nice, but this is what the spectra look like, just for, <laughs> for honesty here. <clears throat> uh, NASA had a press briefing with that paper that came out. That was a big deal, got lots of attention. Um, it was a few weeks before the, the movie, The Martian, came out, so somebody decided to modify the, uh, the poster for The Martian. Instead of bring him home, it's bring Watney a straw. Um, <clears throat> and I like this uh, cartoon with uh, Martian spring water, two million per bottle. I just wish we could actually do Mars sample return for only two million per, per container. <laughs> Plus shipping. Plus shipping. <laughs> <clears throat> I will point out, I mean, this was made, made a big deal. It is a de new detection, but the first suggestion that salty water could exist on Mars today was actually made by Lightman Murray in 1966. <laughs> okay, so how do RSL form? Uh, dry flows, they're on angle reposer, steeper slopes. I'll say more about that but it's difficult to explain the peculiar temporal behavior of these. CO2 frost-driven, we see these dark streaks in polar regions that, that grow gradually, they look very similar, but, but that can be excluded because the temperatures are far too high for CO2. Groundwater release, that can be seasonally modulated, but uh, some of these RSLs start at topographic peaks. I'll show you some examples of that. I think that's implausible. Melting of near-surface ice would certainly work and would match Marion's lab experiments, but the problem is how, 
you know, why is that ice there? These are some of the warmest places on Mars, and even if it was there, how do you replenish it so that these things recur year after year? Then there could be an atmospheric source. There's very little water in the atmosphere, typically about 10 precipitable microns. You take the entire column, you precipitate it on the surface. It's that thick. Uh, but maybe a small amount of water can trigger dry flows in some way, and Marion suggested uh, uh, from boiling is one way to trigger dry flows. <clears throat> this is a look at some of the topographic relations here. This is in uh, Coprati's chasm, and uh, green shows all of the high-rise mapped RSL sites. And in many of these sites, the, the, the fans have this dark fringe on it that's distinctive enough to see it in CTX. So we also map the candidate sites from CTX. So this is incredible density of these things in, in this region of Mars. <clears throat> and here's a molar topographic profile. And you can see these things go right up to the peak and, and cover the local peaks as well. So, uh, you know, and it's, they're so extensive here, I, I don't think this is plausibly directly coming from groundwater. I'd expect that to occur at the bounding faults at the base or something like that. Uh, now, maybe there's, if there is, this is a deep canyon in Mars, if there is groundwater reaching the surface anywhere, this is a reasonable place for it, but I would expect it to, to basically not reach the surface, but, but reach the shallow subsurface where the water evaporates, and maybe that could increase the relative humidity in this region. That's just speculation. Okay, so more about the, the slopes. Uh, Colin has been tabulating from uh, seven DTMs that we had, uh, what the slopes are, where they are, cell occur. And uh, we had a paper here at Woodstone and myself looking at the slip face slopes of active dunes on Mars. <clears throat> the range is from about 28 to 35 degrees, same as on Earth. Uh, the angular repose is the same on Mars and Earth. There was a paper by Kleinheinz at all suggesting that they were different, but we can directly observe that they're the same. <coughs> um, so this strongly suggests a dry flow, granular flow mechanism. Uh, unless something like water is always so volume limited that they can't flow far from the source region, which is kind of the impression we got from some places like Corozal Crater, um, so I decided to look at another site uh, here. This is an Eos Capri chasm. This is a site that was on the cover of Nature Geoscience. Um, and this has some of the longest yet typical RSL, up to 1.5 kilometers. There's some long ones that are atypical. They don't fade over the same time scales. But these are typical in that they fade and reform every year. There's thousands of them in the whole scene, and they range from very short to up to 1.5 kilometers. So why are the lengths so variable? A limited volume of something or topography, and uh, we have a new DTM of this site. Um, so here's the image, and I just quickly mapped representative RSL, the start to the end, drew a straight line. They aren't straight paths, but uh, just representative uh, sampling of, of our cell uh, paths. Here's from the new DTM. This is a slope map now with slopes quantized as shown here. Uh, it's got shaded relief uh, added to it. Uh, and so uh, orange and red are greater than 30 degree slopes. And here's an overlay uh, quick. It's not exactly right, I have to redo this, but of these arrows on top of the slope map. And uh, what we see is not only are they confined to these steep slopes, some of them extend into the, you know, maybe the 29 degree slope areas here at the boundary, but they also extend right to the edge of, of the steep slope area. So if you have a short area of steep slope, if you get a short RSL. If you have a long area of steep slope, you get long RSL. And, and everywhere there's this one-to-one -one match between the length of the angle repose slope and the length of the RSL. And that can't be a coincidence. Uh, I think that the, these lengths are clearly, I think that you know, clearly this indicates that the, the method of motion is, is that of dry cohesionless granular materials. 
So they're still, okay, so they, the flow mechanism may be granular, but there's still all these other puzzling observations, including in this very site, we see these fans that darken when RSL are active, the RSL are individual features, but the whole fan uh, darkens. Um, we see uh, also uh, the unique color properties of some of these uh, fans. Uh, this is the same region. And, and then some of this bright material could be old uh, uh, material deposited in past years. Um, another puzzling observation we see is this dashed pattern of darkening that we see early in the RSL development in some areas. This is in the central peak of Horowitz crater. And uh, uh, this suggests deliquescence to me. That's, that's darkening patches of salt that's left over from previous years. So conclusions, water plays some role in, in RSL activity or triggering it because of the temperature dependence, the detection of hydrating salts, and this is a way of explaining the albedo changes. How water triggers RSL is not clear. Maybe boiling of small amounts of water could trigger dry flow. So maybe changes in hydration affects the cohesion, either increasing or decreasing it. They're perfectly confined to slopes at or steeper than the angle of repose for granular materials. So indicates that, uh, I don't know how to explain that, other than the basic flow mechanism is, is dry granular flow. But the gradual formation, the albedo changes, the yearly recurrence, also the fact that it's just so long and narrow. This is, this is very strange behavior for granular flows on Earth. We've never seen anything like that. Uh, press the wrong button. OK. Uh, the small gullies that are close fit in size to the RSL and RSL fans, I think, are due to the RSL activity, unless it's a coincidence. I don't know how to prove that, but that's what I think. So these small gullies are probably not carved by, by flowing water or wet debris flows. Um, and other equatorial gullies may be confined to steep slopes. We need to confirm that, uh, but that's my specific suspicion, so they could also be formed by dry flows. Thank you. We have two or three minutes for questions, so. Have you made any systematic effort to talk about where they begin as to where they end? Yes, they, 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 they can be hard to, they appear to begin at bedrock outcrops for the most part, or rocky slopes. They can be hard to see over bedrock. They can maybe hide in the cracks, and sometimes you look and you're not sure if you're seeing them or not, or seeing topography when in the animated GIFs. In some places, I think it's clear they begin at the bedrock. They begin at the bedrock. But they, be, and you say they, the color change is what you say that they is? Uh, the, the, the RSL, the darkening of the RSL, yeah. And then uh, that spreads down. Then it spreads down onto these fans, so the bedrock is steeper even, and then the fans so are angular. So the source relationship happening on the bedrock connected to a granular response. So is that how you were saying? Uh, <laughs> I, I can only tell you what I observe. <laughs> um, that the bedrock, of course, gets especially warm. Uh, yeah. It's high thermal inertia, and, and it conducts that heat deeper into the subsurface, so it has interesting properties that may have something to do with it. Any questions about well, What explains the coloring behavior of the slumps where, when they darken and fade? <laughs> You're supposed to answer these questions, not ask them. <laughs> I, you know, it's, it, it looks very similar to the darkening of the RSL, and as we've heard, you know, very small amounts of water can cause darkening from deliquescence. But why would these things darken as a slump forms? I guess it's, it's disturbing the surface layer and exposing subsurface materials, which uh, might lead to deliquescence of, of salts in that deposit. Don't know. Gradual formation, yeah. So we, we can observe these things only at best every couple of weeks. And we see them form, they're small initially, and then they lengthen over time. And so it's either 
grad either they're gradually growing all the time or they're just sort of incrementally growing where we can't sit over there and, and monitor it continuously to really see exactly how it's forming. But it's it do, they don't form all at once. They're 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 at least incremental. They do grow faster initially and then more slowly later on. We can take one more question. And it's just really a comment. Um, when I used to work for Ron Greeley in Nasserain, was doing the dust level simulations, I noticed that if you air pull dust onto the surface and then just blow on it by mistake, it changes the albedo or the perceived albedo a huge amount. So I think this is perhaps relevant to dust level tracks, but maybe it's also an effect of you know when you've got nice dust fall for most of the year onto the surface and then there's some movement that just ruffles up the surface enough to yeah. change the albedo. Yeah, so in general these are the least dusty areas on Mars, but there's some dust everywhere. And then but then if that's the effect, why don't we see albedo changes at other places? Why is it just in some of the steep slopes that form these linear features and I haven't been able to come up with just a dust removal explanation for this. Uh, OK, we need to try to keep to the timetable. So I'd like to uh, thank Alfred. And we can move to the next uh, speaker, please. Uh, Kelly Jan Ray, I hope you pronounce your surname. Rack. Rack, OK. <laughs> Recent and present day activity of Martian gullies. Thank you. <laughs> So yes, thanks. So I have two different um, topics of my talk. I will start with some examples of recent and very young um, activity and ages of gullies. So first I have a study region at the mid-latitudes. This is the Ajaya impact basin at the mid-latitudes of the southern hemisphere on Mars. And the study region was on the northwestern um, part of the rim because here we have the highest density of gullies and we have a very good um, uh, coverage with um, CTX and high-res images. So I measured every gully in this area and I, um, for me a gully is, or I measured the gully channel to be clear that this is one gully. And what I first observed was, or what we first observed was that we have two different types of gullies in this area. So we have, the t I named the type A gullies and type B gullies. So the type A gullies are, look like classical gullies with a very large alcove, a small transportation channel and an apron. So on the other side we have the type B gullies. They look m older or more de, more de Graded, the alcoves are grown together. We have a very long transportation channels, and the aprons are very hard to see. So I observed this, and furthermore, I measured all the orientations of the gullies. And what we see here is that the Type A gullies are more common on the um, equator, uh, on the polar-facing slopes, different from the Type B gullies, which are more on the um, equator facing slopes. This is also caused by a, a further observation that the type A gullies are only um, excavate or um, erode the dust ice mantle which is uh, here the very smooth terrain, the latitude dependent mantle in this area and uh, this mantle is also more on the, on the, on the uh, polar facing slopes and you can see it here, this, that the gully, I think this was shown yesterday, also that only the, the gully um, was eroded. So because of this thing that only the dust ice metal was eroded, I tried some age estimations of these gullies. So I make some crater counts only on the dust ice mantle. And um, I figured out that we have an age of a, about approximately 20 million years for the dust ice mantle. And so the gullies in this area um, have to be younger than 20 million years. So furthermore, I, um, we found out that there are some interesting other stratigraphy. So this here is a, is a scarp from a kind of a glacier-like feature in this area. And we have here a lot of 
ripples or ridges which are completely uncratered even on high-rise images. And on this curve you can see a lot of gullies flowing to the north here. And I will zoom into this here because this is the interesting part. We have here a kind of a channel. You can see here a very small gully channel into this here. So we have some movement over the apron and it's super um, over the ridge field and the apron superposes this this ridge field and it is very interesting to find uh, to find out what for an age we have here but normally it's not possible because because there is no crater on the on the on the ridge field so you cannot do normally crater counts but what we do is we make some very very rough uh, assumptions with one hypothetical crater in this area so i measured the the smallest um, crater in on this um, ridge field on ctx images and on high-rise images and this gives us a very rough estimate of a maximum age for this gully and it comes out that we have 0 0.4 million years on CTX images and 0 0.54 million years on uh, high-rise images so we can say that it's maybe half a year um, half a million years old so the conclusions for the recent gully activity and the mid latitudes is now um, but we have a general formation age of 20 million years of the type A gullies. And because we have two different morphology, we can say that we have either the gullies with the same ages, but maybe a more rapid formation on the e quarter facing slopes, for example, due to a more extensive degradation due to a higher insulation on the e quarter facing slopes, or that we have a two that we have at least two different generations of gullies with older, more degraded type B gullies on the equator facing slopes and younger ones on the polar facing slopes. And furthermore, we have an indicate that we have a very last recent activity in this northwestern part of the Aja Basin of um, half a million years ago. So now I will come from the young gullies and the recent gullies to present day activity of the gullies. So we move further south from the mid latitudes to the polar de deposited layer. So this here is Sisyphikavi. You can see here the, the um, polar cap of the Mars. And um, the study region is in this impact crater with filled ma material. And this here is one of the polar pits. You can see here the polar pit. And on, on all of these slopes, we, if we can find a lot of gullies. But only in one gully on this side here, we have activity in the last Martian years. So what is first very obvious is that all the gullies, they look the same. So they have the same dimensions, the same sizes, also the, the same orientations. You can see also here on the 3D image. But why do we have only activity in this gully? So first I will show the, the uh, example of the activity and uh, we found out, out some changes in the Martian year 31. So these are the albedo I images from high rise beginning at the beginning of spring to the mid spring. And you can see here the defrosting stages. So the brighter the surface is, that the, the more surface ice we have, and it gets sublimated during the um, spring. But what is interesting is that the gully, it appears very dark. So there is no frost, or there is maybe covered frost in the gully, and it gets a little bit more darker, and at some point we have a flow-like feature um, on the western flank of the apron. So I will zoom into this here now. These are um, the three high-rise images at different solar <coughs> uh, 
uh, solar longitudes. So this here is at the beginning of mid-spring. This is directly in mid-spring and a little bit later. And you can see here the, the flow-like feature on the western flank. And then after this flow-like feature we have here, it is hard to see, but we have a small new um, deposition form. I marked it here in red. So, and with a high-rise DTM and with some uh, shadow measurements, <coughs> it was possible to give us a very, uh, here a very rough estimation of, uh, of the amount of material. So this is about 300 to 600 cubic meters of the new material. Um, but in the Martian year 31, we have also activity in the Martian year um, 29 and uh, 30. Now this year is the best example. So we want to figure out what caused these flows and what flows do we have there. So first we looked at the topography and measured the slopes, the slope angles, and it comes out that all the comparable slope here have also very comparable slope angles. So there is no difference in the angle of this active guy and the other ones. So we looked into the um, spectral data. This here is an example of CRISM in the Martian year 28. So earlier, but at the same latitudes in the year at the beginning of spring or in beginning of mid-spring. And what we see here is we have, so this year is the band strength of CO2 and H2O. And what we see here is a dark, uh, feature and this is the active gully and in the interior of the gully we have less volatiles. We have less CO2 and less H2O. This could be either that we have sublimation in this area but this seems very unlikely because why do we have sublimation only in one gully and all the other gullies which are here uh, show no sublimation but they have the same slope angles, the same morphologies and the same sun insulation. So it is more likely that we have a coverage of the still, ex still existing frost cover there, the seasonal frost cover, so that the dark flows is, um, covers this um, seasonal frost cover. Um, we want to make a more seasonal overview of the area and we look into every prism and omega um, image, not only in the study region itself. This, these images, are, we have only th three of them. These are marked with the stars here, but uh, we extend the um, study area to the whole Sisyphicavi at the same latitudes. And this is also shown here. So first we have the changes in the three Martian years. We observed it and, can, and could narrow the, uh, the activity down to occur in the mid-spring. So here's the solar longitude from the beginning of spring to end of spring. Then we um, put all the band strength from CO2 and H2O. And it is obvious that we have here the beginning of the sublimation of CO2 and H2O when the dark flow appears. Furthermore, we measured the uh, maximum daytime surface temperature of TESS in this area. This is shown here uh, in Kelvin. So we have not only, so we have the beginning of the rise of temperature um, in the in mid spring, and then also the beginning of the sublimation of our volatiles and also the dark flows. But this does not solve the problem what caused this. So we have to go one step back to the very early beginning of spring, so at 180 um, degrees solar, solar longitude. And I mapped this out, maybe you can see it, I will zoom into it. We have very early small dark flow-like features um, at the channel alcove and at the um, at the um, alcove and at the channel slopes. So we have some very small dark flows into the interior of the gully. And then we have accumulation of, of material into the gully channel <coughs> on what we think the still existing uh, CO2 um, slab ice cover. 
and then at some point when it goes more um, into it we have um, an outflow so we make some uh, we have to make some assumptions so the assumptions are that we have maybe some outcrops of fine grained material at the gully channel slopes which can be destabilized by the very very early frost sublimation of uh, co2 and then this material flows into the gully interior and the proposed mechanism is now that we have that these um, accumulations are on top of the still existing CO2 frost cover which is in the interior of the gully channel and that then when it gets warmer and warmer that the ongoing sublimation of this underlying CO2 frost cover can support the movement of the material down the gully and makes this new deposition form. So we have a mixture of CO2 gas supported flows down the gully and some small dry flows from the gully slopes to bring to give us the the material in the interior of the gully. So um, the conclusions are now that we have present day activity in this if we cover in mid-spring um, when the sublimation of the volatiles takes place that the present day activity is most likely triggered by the mobilization of dry material by CO2 sublimation and furthermore that we have the ongoing uh, sublimation which can support the movement of the dry material down the gullet. So that's all. Thank you. Some questions maybe. Alfred. So you were describing how some gullies are active and some are not and they have the same slope. But what's the answer to why some are active and some are not? It's maybe open, so this is why we make this assumptions that maybe one gully is a little bit more steeper that we have um, from the frost destabilization, we have some material into the interior, but you know, it's, it's, you cannot really identify this because maybe there are very, very tiny, small flows and uh, it's really open, so we not really have a good idea for this. Um, yeah, this is also a good question. So, when you have some accumulation of dark material onto a, a, a still existing CO2 frost cover, so first it's it's preserved to sublimate, but when it's got heated and heated, then you have more or less a breakout of the sublimation, and then it could be that it support the movement down. So this is also proposed by Kit. Kedilo Flores, I think, in his paper, and um, this is also a model which which could solve this problem of the activity. So it would have yes. to be confined in some way for any pressure. Uh, sorry, what? If its heat is slowly diffusing down, it's going to sublimate slowly and it won't develop any significant pressure. Okay. In some way, we have formulated to CO2 frost. We have uh, many possibilities, but when you show your thing, you have uh, you have really to distinguish two phenomena. One is when, as we discussed yesterday, in some way, the fact that you the presence of CO2 frost above the loose material can trigger big debris flow in some way, mm -hmm. or and it's a two question in the end. <laughs> when you show um, in some of your presentation, the, the alternative is when you can put through. Uh, you know, geysers, issue some material on the CO2 frost, then indeed this material will, will flow down mm -hmm. extremely easily mm -hmm. uh, so right away. So that's what you're talking about. The problem yes. is that we, we believe that this material will not create levee and deep... Uh, no, 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 so, but, sorry. But, but I think both, 
I agree with you. Both uh, yes. both processors are, are, are active mm -hmm. and uh, both have been taken into account. Okay, maybe I forgot to tell. I don't. Um, this is not the formation of the gully. So the mechanism for the formation of the gully is maybe something completely different. This is also the present day activity of the still existing gully. So and we don't. We do not um, ob observe some such levees or very large deep deposition forms. So the model that we have some some dust and sand on top of the. Um, Frost cover, which is go into movement. I think it's okay, but it it is not the the uh, source for the gully itself. So, so, so for instance, we, I don't know if we have time to go back to one of your figure. Uh, okay. Maybe you can say stop. This so one stop. Oh. So for instance, here in the middle figure, you believe that the dark material which is there is actually material that has been deposited above the CO2 ice frost and ready to flow down. Yes. Okay. Are you sure of that? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's clear from the dark spot. I really agree with that. Yes. Spot. In fact, I agree, frankly, but it's just I was wondering if we are sure that uh, uh, this uh, dark. Uh, when, for instance, one possibility is when you have. Uh, okay, so now this is uh, 10 degrees later. And it. it is this CO2 frost? No, this is completely defrosted. So this is this is the normal high-rise image. And this is the same high-rise image, but uh, corrected with a lambda. So this is completely defrosted. This is only the um, reflections of the sun. All right, I adjusted the title a little bit, uh, same content. Uh, so the uh, basic uh, thing here is that uh, we've been studying active gullies uh, on Mars. Uh, we now have 10 years of evidence for activity since uh, Malin et al. in 2006 uh, first reported a couple of new bright deposits associated with gullies. Uh, there's been a question, however, since uh, the first detections of whether uh, this current activity is actually forming gullies or if it's uh, just degrading uh, old pre-existing gullies. And Pelletier et al. in 2008 uh, did modeling of one of these new deposits and concluded that it could be consistent with uh, purely dry uh, mass wasting. So there was at that point, uh, the late part of last decade, uh, the suggestion that uh, this was, uh, uh, these recent activity was uh, just uh, dry, uh, slumping, degrading previous water formed features. Uh, what I'm going to argue today is that current activity indicates uh, that frost processes without melting are forming gullies today. Uh, I'll go through a, a couple different things. The seasonal timing of activity that we see implicates frost, which is almost all CO2 frost, as the cause of most activity. There's, these are steep slopes, so there may also be a component of dry activity, uh, volatile free. And then uh, also there are a number of features that have been suggested as diagnostic or suggestive of aqueous processes, fluvial or debris flow, uh, that are forming today. And so I think that the combination of these two points indicates that what we're seeing is actually active gully formation. So we've been monitoring gullies uh, with high rise now since we got there, uh, taking uh, regular or as regular as possible repeat images. Uh, we now have uh, over 300 monitoring sites in the southern hemisphere and over 100 in the north uh, where we have long baseline repeat coverage with high rise. Uh, sometimes the quality of the images is variable. We don't necessarily get the right lighting match every time. And we see activity at uh, dozens of these sites. Uh, so uh, uh, what you can see here, the yellow sites are the ones that are uh, currently known to have activity uh, the blue sites are the monitoring sites where we haven't yet seen activity. Uh, and I believe it's uh, on the order of 14% of sites in the southern hemisphere uh, have been active at least once, and a few percent in the northern hemisphere. The north appears to be less active. Uh, to co compare with the overall distribution of gullies, uh, this is a map that we've seen a whole lot uh, the last two days. Uh, these are uh, mid-latitude gullies, and uh, if you flip uh, back and forth, 
Uh, we're not, uh, there are some biases in high-rise coverage and obviously we can't get repeat coverage of all those sites. Uh, but this is a pretty good sampling of the overall distribution of gullies. You can see concentrations in our monitoring sites uh, where there are concentrations in gullies overall. Uh, now the timing of the activity that we see uh, is really important to understanding the processes. And uh, often we have images that are separated by a Mars year or two. We can't really say much about the seasonal timing. Uh, but for a number of these events now, uh, we have uh, timing constraints that are to less than 180 degrees of Elsebes, more or less half a Mars year, although a degree of Elsebes isn't a linear unit of time. And what you can see, uh, this is the sites in the southern hemisphere. Uh, there's a pronounced uh, seasonality. Uh, the activity uh, at the lower latitudes, 30 to 40, uh, occurs between uh, around Elsebes 90 to 180 uh, when seasonal frost is present and as it's going away. Uh, as you go to higher latitudes, that relationship with frost remains, but because there's more frost which lasts longer, uh, the activity is delayed, as Jan was just talking about in the last talk. Uh, here it's uh, more in the, into spring rather than winter. Uh, but there's this clear correlation with seasonal frost, uh, mostly CO2. Uh, some of the activity uh, may be uh, driven by H2O frost, uh, but it's not due to melting. I'll talk about that more in the next slide. Uh, and there's assorted mechanisms that have been proposed. We've just heard about a couple of these. Uh, sublimation and uh, gas pressurization or fluidization by material uh, superposed on top of the frost. Uh, frosted granular flow was suggested by Chris Hugenholtz in 2008, uh, which could work with either uh, H2O or CO2 frost. So there are a number of possible uh, processes that may be driving uh, this, and it's entirely reasonable to think that they're all involved in, in some amounts in some place. Now, uh, water frost uh, may be involved in some activity as well. Uh, Matthew Vincenda yesterday was mentioning uh, that uh, some of the bright deposits have detections of water frost, but not CO2 frost. And so it may be that uh, frost is still the driver there, but I think we can say that it's not due to melting. And the reason for this is uh, based on the heat budget, uh, which goes back to Ingersoll and uh, in the 70s. And uh, Margot uh, Valls was talking yesterday about uh, continuation of this idea. The basic problem is uh, that uh, the latent heat loss to sublimation prevents you from ever getting to the normal melting temperature. So uh, the heat loss uh, at 273K is over 300 watts per square meter to radiation. Uh, you can reduce that uh, somewhat if you replace the cold sky by warmer slopes uh, radiating some heat. You lose uh, some heat to conduction to the subsurface, uh, but the latent heat loss to sublimation is the real killer. It ramps up uh, very steeply as you get close to the melting temperature. And so due to free convection with no wind, uh, you lose over 600 watts per square meter uh, 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 to this latent heat effect, uh, and wind only makes things worse. Now, the maximum possible insulation on Mars for a surface that's normal to the sun at perihelion uh, is just over 700 watts per square meter. And so uh, you, lose more, uh, you lose more heat to these combined effects uh, than you can possibly input. And what this means is you never actually get to the melting temperature. Uh, brines can affect this, but we'd expect atmospherically deposited frost to be relatively clean, uh, low salt content. Uh, now, there's, I said there's a clear correlation of gullies and frost. Uh, and here's for comparison on a global scale. Uh, 2010 uh, contour showing the rough edge of detections of frost uh, in the southern hemisphere. Uh, and it lines up pretty well both with the boundary of gullies and boundary of activity. There's a little bit of error, which may just be due to a resolution effect on the chrism and omega uh, in terms of uh, finding the very lowest latitude and smallest patches of frost. Now we see uh, all sorts of activity in gullies at this point. Uh, channels uh, were early on suggested to require liquid water uh, as to be an indicator that these were fluvial or debris flow features. Uh, but we see channel incision occurring in the present climate, and it's not uh, just a superficial minor effect. Uh, this is a 25 meter scale bar. Uh, we were talking about tractors yesterday. This is the MSL rover at the same scale. And this is a 50 meter long channel, several meters wide, probably at least tens of centimeters deep. Uh, and uh, this is also illustrating another effect, which is that it's jumped the banks of the previous channel, is cutting a new one. 
Uh, and so this is a way to develop uh, nastimosing or braided uh, gullies uh, in the current climate. <coughs> Uh, we've seen lobate deposits. Uh, this is, uh, you can see the snout of the lobate flow here. Uh, this is, uh, scale bar is the same as the previous one, I believe. So this is meters wide and probably uh, tens of centimeters to a meter thick. Uh, it's also transporting boulders. Uh, you can see uh, meter scale rocks within this new deposit uh, have been uh, moved down the gully. So these are very substantial morphologic changes. They're not superficial or minor. Uh, and they're fundamentally uh, changing the appearance of the gully aprons. Uh, many of the deposits are much thinner, uh, more superficial, uh, but we've seen now a number of examples of these more substantial deposits. Uh, here's another example. This is actually further up uh, within the same gully, and it was the same event. Uh, you can see uh, higher up within uh, the channels within the alcove, uh, you can see both uh, erosion and deposition of these channels. Uh, this one here widens, for instance and there are changes along this as well. And uh, in this and many other examples, uh, we see a de clear deposit at the bottom, but as you go further up, uh, the source uh, point is actually rather diffuse. There's not a single major event that triggered this. Uh, terraces have also been occasionally suggested as fluvial features, uh, but these are also forming today. You can see here, uh, Within a previous channel, uh, you had additional erosion, but not quite on the same scale, and so you leave an apparent terrace uh, by this uh, same sort of process. Uh, sinuous channels have also been suggested as indicators of water, uh, but as uh, two talks ago it was discussed, uh, sinuosity is developing uh, within channels today. Uh, it's especially pronounced in dune gullies, where we see the largest, uh, most frequent changes, probably because it's a weak substrate. Uh, concave uh, longitudinal profiles are also observed. Uh, this is uh, the Matara Crater Dune Gully that was uh, previously discussed. It's extremely active. Uh, it has a concave longitudinal profile, and uh, it's, this has had major mass flow events in every year that we've been monitoring. So this has been fundamentally reworked uh, since, say, 500,000 years ago, high obliquity periods. Uh, so it's uh, the morphology can't be a relic of that kind of climate, uh, a different climate at that time. Uh, levied lobate flows are also sometimes suggested as signs of water, uh, but here I'm showing uh, new uh, levied flows on a sand dune. Uh, this wouldn't even normally qualify as a gully, although there's a hint of a channel there. Uh, but uh, uh, this is a major uh, levied uh, mass movement occurring in equatorial sand. So whether this was even triggered by frost, uh, at this latitude, there should be very little. It may be purely dry. What's the latitude? Uh, this is about five, seven and a half degrees north. Yep. So uh, what actually controls the activity and uh, which gullies are active? Uh, we've looked at the kilometer scale thermophysical properties of the site, uh, albedo, uh, thermal inertia, uh, elevation. Uh, there's essentially uh, nothing detectable. Uh, the high latitude gullies also have uh, lower thermal inertia, which gives the impression that low thermal inertia is involved, but maybe latitude instead. Uh, the elevation had uh, essentially no effect. Uh, albedo had no effect. Uh, and you can see the main uh, control is actually which hemisphere you're in. The northern hemisphere gullies were less active. Uh, examining fresh versus uh, degraded looking gullies, fresh to moderately fresh gullies uh, were uh, significantly more active. And so it's likely that activity causes uh, this fresh appearance, uh, which is suggestive, again, that uh, this is ongoing formation. Uh, the substrate has an effect on activity. Dune gullies are particularly active. Uh, they have particularly large changes and particularly frequent. And uh, this is likely because sand is a relatively weak and unstable substrate compared with uh, crater wall materials. Uh, hemisphere also has an effect. Uh, there have been few changes in the northern hemisphere, and uh, we suspect that this is because CO2 frost uh, is presently less extensive there. Uh, the winter is uh, shorter and warmer, uh, so the frost is not found at as low latitude, and it's not as abundant. So to sum this up, uh, we think that gully formation is ongoing by current processes. We believe that the activity we're seeing uh, is contributing to ongoing gully formation. 
and current activity isn't just degrading some old fluvial landforms or debris flow landforms. And many of these events that we're seeing probably contribute to creating each gully. Uh, the events we're seeing are quite substantial, but uh, many of these, the gullies would often require hundreds or a few thousand of these events. And we see recurrence uh, intervals uh, based on this, uh, the fraction of activity that we've seen so far on the order of hundreds to maybe thousands of years. So uh, if you combine those numbers, age estimates for gullies that you would get out of this uh, the formation uh, could have started as few as uh, a few million, maybe 10 million years ago. And undoubtedly, the rates uh, vary in space and time. There's no reason to suspect that things are perfectly constant over time or space. Uh, but uh, there's no need to invoke any very different past climates that allow substantial melting and or runoff or anything like that. Uh, the current formation processes are probably dominated by CO2 frost. H2O frost uh, may be involved as well uh, by sublimating or uh, perhaps uh, reducing the friction between grains, but it's uh, probably not by melting. And, uh, but CO2 frost is volumetrically uh, dominant. Uh, H2O frost is very thin, and so the CO2 also sublimates more vigorously. It's almost certainly uh, having the most important effect. And the last thing is that many of these apparently aqueous morphologies uh, do not require water. Uh, they're forming uh, today and driven by frost. Thank you. I'd be happy to take questions. So, some questions. Is there a, um, have you looked at the slopes that we see processes are occurring? Is there, do you find the same as others have reported some slope? lower range to which we find current activity going down here? Haven't looked in detail. Uh, we don't have enough DTMs yet to look at all of these, so that's something I'd like to do. And, and the second part of the is, is that you use this word frost, granular flow, something like that. Is there any possibility that, although you say strongly that you can't um, melt the ice, could ice be incorporated in a flow and melt in the dynamics of the flow and create liquid effects there? You mean like frictional uh, melting within a flow? Yeah. Uh, that's possible. Uh, I don't know how that the kinetic energy would be enough to melt a significant amount, but the water frost abundances are also negligible. Uh, they're tens of microns, maybe a few hundred microns, and the volumes of these larger flows are hundreds of cubic meters, and so the water volume involved would be pretty trivial, even if it somehow melts. Um, first, I, would, I think this work is fantastic, and I think you work with ultimately uh, solve the <laughs> history of gullies. In fact, the, the new, I, I've never seen the, the superposition of the, your two famous images you uh, presented to the paper. And there we see that there is a real new gully in, uh, in some way forming, so it's very striking. I just had one comment about the comparison between CO2 frost and water ice frost. I think it's a good idea, but uh, the thing to remember is that there are much less water ice frost involved a typical rule of thumb is that you have 1,000, in most models and probably in the reality, you have 1,000 less uh, less uh, water ice frost compared to CO2 ice frost. For instance, when you have 10 centimeter of CO2 ice frost, you have about 100 micron of water ice frost. So it's so there's no yeah. accumulation of ice over time. So no, th this is all seasonal frost. It's all and seasonal, so, yeah. so there'd be no deeper water. There may be frozen water ice at some depth, and I thought that the talk about yes. you know, slow erosion of that uh, was interesting yesterday, yeah. but what's actually driving the activity is the seasonal frost. Oh, so the idea, though, is I'm sort of asking is, could the CO2 initiate it, the initiate material that has frozen? Uh, if it, since the erosion uh, up the slope tends to be, uh, it fades out, it's probably not very deep. I, uh, the Up on the slopes, uh, it's probably hard frozen ground. Uh, that's got relatively massive ice in it. That's what we expect from the ice table. And so I don't think that a, one single event like this uh, would be eroding into that. Uh, it's uh, too strongly cemented. Uh, but instead, as Francois talked about yesterday, probably you scrape off the cover, and then you sublimate, and you free up more loose material. Yes. Yes, the, the cemented ground that you mentioned is really hard. Uh, it's, it's mechanically, it's extremely rough. Uh, the Phoenix, uh, Phoenix, uh, Phoenix mission took along a drill in order to get into this stuff. Just take another question. Um, can you go back to your levee image? I just can't see where, you, where the levees were in the minute. Uh, 
this here and uh, along this here. So the, the width of the Leve flow is maybe 50 meters, is this what you're saying? Or uh, something on that order, yeah, okay. uh, for the That's larger one. Uh, this one is narrower. This is more like 10. Uh, uh, but this is also not exactly the same morphology as, say, the linear dune gullies. Uh, not for sure, no. Uh, it's, uh, we usually don't have good, good enough timing constraints to say exactly when during the defrosting process uh, this happens. So you go from whatever frost thickness you have initially down to zero. And uh, since the timing constraints are not tight and uh, the source, uh, we don't know how much of that frost then gets incorporated into the flow, there's a number of variables. There was a question at the back. Was it? No, okay. 